Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Test Driving Selenium 4 with Angie Jones. I'm sure you're all familiar with our guest speaker, but before she kicks off, I'll give a short intro anyway. A principal developer advocate at Apply Tools, Angie Jones specializes in test automation strategies and techniques. A pillar of the global test automation community, Angie is a world-renowned speaker and thought leader, and you can often find her presenting and teaching at international software conferences, now obviously mostly virtual. She's also the driving force and director of Test Automation University, a free online educational platform providing test automation courses by leading instructors. So be sure to check that out after our session. So without any further ado, Angie, the stage is yours. Thank you so much, Adi. Hi, everyone. Angie here. Let's go for a ride as we explore the new upcoming features of Selenium 4. Let me start off by stating I'm not an expert in Selenium 4. In fact, it hasn't been officially released yet. And to answer your burning question, <laughs> no, we don't know when it will be released as the date has not been set yet. That's why the name of this talk is Test Driving Selenium 4. So everything today will be based on me exploring the alpha version of Selenium 4 and using my insight and experience as an automation architect to guide you. So buckle up and let's drive. The first feature I like to cover is relative locators, okay? And as Adib pointed out, for any latecomers, after I go over the features, I'll stop and I'll, you know, answer any questions you have. So as I'm speaking, if you have a question about something, just go ahead and post it in there. And I've saved uh, some time for us to, you know, have a discussion, right? I don't want to just talk at you, okay? All right, so relative locators. So we're all used to the standard approaches to locating elements, right? So ID, name, class name, XPath, CSS selectors, et cetera, et cetera. Well, Selenium 4 is offering a new approach to this where it allows you to identify elements in relation to other elements. For example, you could do something like find the element to the left of another element. Likewise, you can also find elements to the right, above, below, near. And we're going to look at an example now. So let me show you this app. So this is a grid of some great books on test automation. And let's have a look at this classic book, Agile Testing by Lisa Crispin and Janet Gregory. If we wanted to verify that the book to the left of this is experiences of test automation, then relative locators can help us do this. Let's see how. Okay, so here's the DOM for that list of books. And as you can see, Agile Testing has an ID of PID3. And what we want to get a hold of is the element that's to the left of this, which is also an LI and has an ID of PID2, okay? So within our code, we do element just like we currently do. However, instead of using one of the existing locator strategies, such as by ID, we instead use this new with tag name method. And within this method, we give it the tag name of the relative element that we're looking for. So we know that the element to the left is an LI, so that's what we provide here. And then we specify the direction to look into. Since we want the LI to the left of PID3, we use this new left of method and we provide the locator of the main element, which in our case, is PID3, okay? Now, given this, we could assert 
that the ID of the returned element is PID2. But not so fast. Our test actually failed because the element found to the left of PID3 was PID1. What? Why is this? Well, let's go back to the application again. All right, so just to recap, when we asked for the element to the left of PID3, we were given PID1. And it's not the element that's immediately to the left of PID3, but it is indeed to the left. And when we think about how selenium works, this makes more sense. Because anytime we ask selenium to find an element, by default, it starts at the root of the DOM and it's going to return the first element that matches the locator. So in our case, we said, find us an LI element that's to the left of PID3. And that's exactly what Selenium did, right? So what if we ask Selenium to find us a list of all of the elements? that are to the left of PID3. We should get both PID1 and PID2, right? Well, yeah, we do, but we also get PID5 and PID6 as well. Where did those come from? Well, let's look at the app again. Okay, so PID3 is the main element and we ask Selenium for all of the LI elements that are to the left of PID3. And yes, when we look at this, technically PID1, 2, 5, and 6 are all to the left of PID3. So this is working as designed, but it's just not really as one might intuitively expect. So what do we do to say, look, Selenium, I want to make sure PID2 is where it's supposed to be in relation to PID3. Well, we can chain the relative locators together. So if I say, find me the LI to the left of PID3 and to the right of PID1, then that should get me PID2. All right, so let's try this again. <laughs> we can say, find us an LI element that is to the left of PID3 and is also to the right of PID1. And we expect that this will be PID2. And this passes, okay? Now, if you're going to use relative locators, you'll need to be careful. In my limited exploration of the feature, I ran into a couple of gotchas that you should be aware of. One of which is that our tests don't always run in the same window size, right? So when testing a UI, it's a really good practice to make sure that the scenarios work in the various responsive viewports that your application supports. Well, you can probably see right away that our test that uses relative locators is broken when we try to execute against this iPhone 10 viewport size because none of the books are to the left or to the right of each other. So this is definitely something to keep in mind if you're going to run across multiple viewport or window sizes. Okay, another thing to note is that the DOM can be a mysterious thing and everything is not always as it seems. For example, although working with the list of books was a bit complicated at first, once we realized how it worked, it was relatively straightforward, right? But every case won't be like that. Let's look at this application. So this is a to-do list with two items and each item has a radio button and a label, okay? So let's say I wanted to click the radio button next to the goodbye world label. 
Now, this seems like a really great use of relative locators, right? Let's try it out. Here's the HTML for that Goodbye World label and the radio button next to it. And then here's the code that says, find the element with a tag of input that is to the left of a label with the text Goodbye World, okay? So this looks pretty straightforward, much easier than the books, right? However, when we run this, we get a no such element exception, which is a bit puzzling because the input is clearly to the left of the label. So why can't Selenium find it? What could be the problem? Well, apparently looks can be misleading. So this has become a proper mystery, y'all, all right? So I dug deeper into how relative locators was implemented and I found a clue. Under the covers, Selenium is using a JavaScript method called get bounding client rect. And what this method does is it returns the size of an element, but more importantly, it's X and Y coordinates within the viewport. So I ran this get bounding client rec method. That is a tongue twister. <laughs> but I ran that method on both the label and the input and aha, look at what's returned for X in both of those cases. Both of them have an X position of 838. So what does that mean? It means that even though on the surface, when we look at it, it appears to be side by side, the label is actually overlapping the input. So mystery solved. This is why the input element cannot be found to the left of the Goodbye World label because it's not actually to the left in the DOM, okay? So it's great <laughs> to have another tool in our tool belt, but my advice to you is to use relative locators sparingly. I think using IDs and names as locators is still by far your best option and everything else including relative locators, should only be used when ID and name are not available or cannot meet your needs, okay? In addition to the gotchas that I've demonstrated with responsive testing, with overlapping elements, with unexpected <laughs> neighboring elements, there's also this huge dependency on the layout of the page. Right? So as additional elements are added, removed, or rearranged, there's a likely chance that your tests are going to break. So I view relative locators as a fragile strategy. And when I say that, that's not me knocking it, right? That doesn't mean there's no use for relative locators. In fact, other tools like uh, Sahi and Tycho, they've already, they already have a similar feature like this. So apparently there is a demand for this type of thing. Just please, as always, use good judgment and only use relative locators when you absolutely need them, all right? I also recommend that you use, when you do use relative locators, that you use them for interaction and not for verification purposes. For example, clicking a button that's next to a label, this seems like a good use for relative locators. However, attempting to verify the appearance of the application via the DOM, that is not a reliable strategy. We saw how things got a little goofy with uh, the book grid, right? So instead, I recommend you use visual testing if you need to verify the appearance of your application. Um, Applitudes can ensure that everything is positioned perfectly without needing to rely on the DOM to determine this. All right, 
So question time before moving on to the next feature, I'm going to pause and see if there are any questions on relative locators. So yeah, we do have questions. Um, um, so the first one, I think that you answered it, but I'm going to ask it anyway. If you did, then we'll just move on to the next one. Uh, because it was it was just it was entered at the very beginning of the presentation. How close above to the left does the element have to be? That's a good question, right? Okay, so above, below, left, or right has to be at least like one pixel in that direction, right? So if it's zero pixels, like we saw with the overlapping, it doesn't consider that left, right, above, or below. There's also a fifth one that's called near. And by default, that one should be between one and 50 pixels away. And I say one, and but I'm guessing that because I try the near out and um, on that, on that to do application, I tried near thinking like, okay, this is like zero pixels apart, but would near still catch this? And it did not. Um, so I opened a bug. I think I opened a bug. I need to check that. Um, I, but I definitely told the, the, the Selenium uh, maintainers about that issue. So it might change to be zero to 50. Um, or one to 50, but anyway, it needs to be less than 50 to be considered near, right? And that's customizable, so uh, you can change that to be, you know, if you need it to be 100 or 300 or whatever, you can change it and say, I want it near, you know, 300 or whatever, okay? Uh, next question. Uh, so, the next question is, does that mean, I'm sorry, I don't know what that, which uh, slide it means, but does that mean that the DOM changes with respect to viewport of where it is being rendered? So, yes, the DOM does change with responsive apps, if your app is responsive, right? So most apps these days are responsive. When you think about, um, when you use your uh, the same application, right? If I go to some application on my phone and I go to it on my desktop, the DOM is different. And in some cases, like for example, a common one is that you then get a hamburger menu shown when you go on your mobile phone, right? And as we saw that list grid changed from being four items in a row to one item on a row in my uh, on my phone right so the dom does change depending on the viewport size if it's a responsive app right if your app is not responsive <laughs> meaning it looks exactly the same on uh web and mobile it's probably not that good looking but um that's a possibility as well and then you might be able to use something like this Uh, is there a way to tell Selenium, opening quotes, PID3 is the center of the universe, end quotes, so that it's not in DOM order, but relative to this quote unquote center. Therefore, now to left would return what we wanted, a more readable and concise and how a, a user would frame the use case. So, no, <laughs> you can say the way you're saying, like, this is the thing I care about is in the uh, those directional methods. So in the two left or two right, you're saying two left of this, right? PID3, this is what I care about. However, Selenium is not going to start there. Um, it's going to start at the top of the dom right and it's looking for um it's looking for the first thing now you might be able to this is interesting and i haven't tried this but you might be able to say find the element pid3 right and then do a dot find element on that and then say to the left right so that would be the 
based on my experience, I'm guessing here, but based on my experience, I would think that would be a way to tell Selenium, this is where I want you to start and then um, look to the left. But when it looks to the left, I'm not sure if it's going to then start at the, you know, the root of the DOM or kind of traverse backwards to find the left element. I'm going to try that after. I don't know for sure, but that might be a way to do it. You try it too. All right. We'll both try it. Um, what was your solution to click on the radio button? Great question. <laughs> so um, when it didn't work with the two left, I then tried the near option, thinking that that would get me what I need, but that didn't work either. And when I brought it up to the project uh, maintainers, they acknowledged that it was a bug, but that was quite a while ago. And I tried this again before this talk and it still wasn't working. So I don't know if they've decided, I need to go look and see if I actually opened a ticket on that. But I, I don't know if they decided, you know, it's working as expected and it should be at least one pixel away or not. So I just didn't use relative locators in that case anymore. That wasn't working for me. And I went back to the old fashioned X path, you know, find me the label, that's in relation to um, this input field. Um, do you advise that we always go with relative locators? What's the strategy of when to use them? Yeah, don't always go with them. Um, I think you should think of this, if, a, if, if there was a hierarchy, right, of what you should use when. I think that this would be towards the bottom of that hierarchy. So stay with your um, stay with your ID and your name as you know top tier locators to use, right? And then beyond that, I would then go to like CSS or XPath. Then there's link text and stuff like that. So I consider relative locators like down and priority towards like link text and stuff like that. Do these work with page object factory? So page object factory is uh, being deprecated. Uh, Simon Stewart, the lead of the Selenium project, a couple of years ago, uh, he stated during a Selenium conference that Page Object Factory was a mistake <laughs> and he wished he hadn't have implemented it in the project and he advised us not to use it. So ever since then, I've not used it. So I've not done anything with Page Object Factory in years. And I did see that this was being deprecated in at least the um i think java and c sharp bindings so i don't know if it works for page object factory but you should probably move away from that strategy since it's going away and another question does it work with shadow dom or iframe elements yeah so well shadow dom uh that one might be a little bit trickier as you need to like use JavaScript and stuff to get to it. But I think once you have a hold of the element, then yes, it should still work and definitely work with iframes. As long as you can get a handle to the element, then this should work for you. So we're getting a lot of uh, follow-up questions. What would you suggest in place of page object, uh, page object factory? I use my buys. If you go to my, um, go to my GitHub and just look at any of my repos, I use uh, the page object model. So not the factory. And I just go ahead and declare my elements um, as buys and then I use them when I need to use them. So check out uh, my GitHub repo. My name is Angie Jones, no spaces, no special characters. Um, and there's plenty of examples of how I, I do it.
So we got a couple of questions about overlapping uh, objects and overlapping elements. So, um, so does it work on overlapping objects? For example, clicking on a button inside an open pop-up, which is below an object on the main screen. <laughs> they said it was difficult to explain. They they <laughs> said it was difficult to explain, but um, yeah, I'm, I get, I'm, getting, I I'm asking you. It, it went in calling. So, um, my advice is try it out. And that get, what was the name of it? Get client bounding rect. <laughs> that method, um, get the slides after this so, so you know what method I'm talking about. But if you, I just open up Chrome DevTools and then I run um, that method on any of the elements that I want to see the relation. If I'm not sure, you know, and then I can see from the X and Y coordinates, like, what is this considered left in the DOM? Is this considered above in the DOM? So that's a way where you can uh, check any elements you want. Just run it for um, the first element that you want and then run it again for the second element and then compare the X and Y coordinates and then you'll have your answer there. All right. Um, so I saw someone ask also about sibling elements. Um, do the elements have to be sibling elements to find on the left or the right? They don't have to be siblings. That's a good question. So um, in the example I showed with the books, all of those allies were siblings. They do not have to be siblings, meaning they don't have to be under the same parent element, okay? Can we use jQuery to find the elements instead of XPath or CSS? Um, so under the covers, it's using JavaScript, which essentially jQuery is using that same JavaScript. So it's using the JavaScript command under the covers, um, document dot, you know, I think it's get element, get element by whatever, right? So, to answer your question, whatever technique you use is going to all boil down to those commands under the covers. Does Selenium 4 introduce changes in handling stale element exceptions? Let me say it again. The, um, uh, the, did or did Selenium 4 introduce changes in handling stale element exceptions? There are some exceptions that have um, been modified, but honestly, I haven't taken a look at those just yet. Um, so stay tuned. <laughs> um, there, I know there's some, some, I think some new ones, maybe some deprecated ones, some better messaging and stuff like that. I'm not sure if stale element Exception is one though. How do we handle time specific objects? Uh, like a field that appears in a, in a specific time frame and then disappears? Yeah, you use, so this one is not um, related to the relative locators, but you can use Selenium's, uh, they have a class called WebDriver Wait. And this allows you to wait conditionally for whatever it is. So you can say, wait for this specific element to appear or disappear or whatever. So that's how you would handle that. All right, Adi, I'm going to move on. I know there's, I'm looking at them, there's a lot more questions. Um, so I'll come back to those if we have time at the end, but I'm gonna keep on driving. That was our pit stop. I'm going to keep on driving um, to show you some more stuff, okay? All right, so um, next new feature. Opening a brand new window or tab in Selenium 3, this wasn't very intuitive, right? There was no built-in method to allow you to do this. And instead, you needed to send the command or control plus the T keys to the body, element of the dom like it was nasty <laughs> but in selenium 4 this has become much easier to do so we call the get a driver.get to open the initial window just like we did before right and that'll open a window up okay then when you're ready 
to open a new win a new window or a new tab, you can call driver.switchTo. And from there, there's a new method here called new window. And inside of new window, you can specify whether you want it to be a window or a tab by using this window type enum as shown on line two. And this will open a blank window or tab. So there's no URL just yet, right? You're just opening the tab or the window, okay? And then to enter a URL into that new window or tab, you call either drive.get, again, like I did here, um, and you pass in the URL, or you can call driver.navigate.2 and pass in the URL there. Either one, it'll work. Okay, so that one's pretty straightforward. And then the switch back and forth between the windows or tabs, you're gonna use the same approach that you did in Selenium 3, right? Which is you're gonna call driver.get window handles, and then you switch when you're ready to switch, uh, switch to the window. Okay. So this feature is pretty straightforward. It's essentially just a convenience method to allow you to open new tabs or windows without needing to jump through hoops <laughs> um, to be able to do so. So very straightforward. I don't have anything else on that one. Uh, let's take a quick pit stop. Any questions on windows or tabs before we move on? So yeah, we did. Uh, does the new window tab use the same cookie store as the original? or Very a different good. cookie store, uh, could you have two tabs logged in as two different users? Oh, no. okay, that's good. I like that question. All right, so it's the same session, right? And when I say session, I mean the same like Selenium session, but it's going to work as far as the cookie stores and stuff, it's gonna work exactly like if we were to do this as a human being and make a new tab a window. I don't know, uh, when I open a new tab, do I have the same cookie store? I don't know, I don't think so, do I? I don't know that answer. Um, <laughs> but it's whatever happens when you do that in real life with a browser without using the automation tool. But what this is going to do is allow you to manage both of those windows with the same um, Selenium session, right? So if I were to, let's say, for example, I opened one application, I logged in as some user there, right? And then I opened a new tab and went to that application. If the cookie is already stored and it knows that I'm this user, then I'm probably already logged in, right? If that's not stored, then this becomes another, a new session, if you will. I like that. I'm going to try that scenario out just to confirm. But then, yeah, that was a great question. So we got a few questions about how to switch to the previous window. Mm -hmm. All right. So let me, um, I'm going to back up. I don't know if I left that one up long enough. Okay, so here's how you would switch. Same thing, nothing changed with the switching, right? So what I did here is I got all of the window handles, right? And those window handles, they are not um, human readable things. They're like GUIDs. So I got the window handles, and then I just looped through those handles because that's what you need to pass to Selenium to say when you wanna to switch to something. So this line three right here, this is um, this is the same right now in Selenium three. You just pass the window handle and say you wanna to switch to that window, right? And so the way that uh, we do it is we just switch through all of them and you add some kind of conditional logic for when you wanna stop switching through them. So it's gonna start with the first one, um, it goes to the second one, you know, and I'm comparing which one of these have this title and then I know which window I'm on. Once I switch to that one, we can stop switching and let me get out of here. So this is the same technique that everyone uses now. And we got uh, several questions about how to open a, an incognito win window. 
Yeah, so selenium already um, opens them as incognito. Now, when I called, that's interesting. I'm wondering if like the difference between driver.get and driver.navigate uh, to might be that, might start like that new incognito session, right? Because um, when you launch Selenium, like let's say that on my Chrome right now, I'm logged into Gmail, you know, I got the cookies and everything, they know who I am. When I open Gmail in my browser right now, manually, it knows this is Angie. But if I were to open Gmail with Selenium, it opens as a new incognito window, right? So it's not pulling any of my personal uh, data or history into that window. So when I then open this new window, what I'm not sure about is if that is a you know, brand new incognito session or a, a continuance of the session that I've already started as far as browser session. I'm going to check on that. I'm going to check on that. Okay. All right. So let's see. Anything else before I go on, Adi? Uh, th yeah, there were a few questions. Um, any changes in headless browsers related to window? No, the headless stuff is still the same. Um, there was some deprecation in like um, the capability stuff. So, but that was kind of being removed in like version three. So I had already started using the new approach, which is to use options instead. Um, so that's available in version three. And I think we'll see more of that might be officially like deprecated in version four. Um, so no difference to the headless itself, just the matter of how you specify you want to run headless. Okay. Um, sorry, I lost my place. Um, what, uh, what do we do if we want to open multiple tabs in the same window? Yeah, so that was the example that we we showed here. So let me go here, and I'm gonna open. I'm gonna answer two questions with one right here. Okay, so line two right there. This is one window, two tabs, right? And then if you wanted two windows, one tab each, instead of saying window type dot tab, you would say window type dot window. And then I saw another question that says, what do I mean by window type? That's what I mean right there. So that window type is an enum, right? And so you specify, it has like built-in options already. Tab and window, I think, are the only two. So you specify, I want a tab or I want a window, okay? And that's how Selenium knows to open a brand new browser window for you or make a new tab within the same window. Do we still have different drivers for different browsers? Yes, you still have um, different drivers and there are some changes to that. So Chromium is like a fairly new um, browser engine and it's one that like other browsers like Chrome and Edge, they're all like built on top of this Chromium, right? So Chromium, um, is a new driver. And now Chrome driver extends from Chromium and also Edge extends from Chromium, right? So that's your new drivers. You can still use, I don't think any of them have been deprecated, so you can still use whatever it is. Like if you wanna just use Chrome driver, that's fine. If you wanna use, um, some people use like the the parenting type, which is uh, what is it? I can't remember right now. Uh, web driver, web driver. <laughs> so you would use like web driver and then you know instantiate it as Chrome driver, whatever. Um, but yeah, Chrome Chromium is the new one, and I'm gonna get into a bit of that. So let me go ahead and go there now. All right, so. Let's get back to where we were. We were here. 
Chrome DevTools protocol. All right, y'all, this one is super exciting, right? So Chrome DevTools protocol, um, or CDP for short, you're gonna hear people say CDP, right? This is essentially a set of tools that enables you to access and control Chrome and Chromium-based browsers via Chrome DevTools. What does that mean? All right. <laughs> you know Chrome DevTools. This is a place where you go to inspect your elements to find their locators, right? But there's a lot of other domains here, not just elements. So you see elements here, but there's also console, there's sources, there's network, performance, security. Over here, there's run commands. So there's a whole bunch of commands that you can run. There's this console drawer. There's a bunch of stuff in here, right? Bunch of commands, bunch of sensors and stuff. Now, Selenium 4 is providing an API that is essentially a wrapper around the raw CDP commands, right? And people say CDP, like Simon tweeted about CDP and I'm one of those people, I'm not afraid to ask when I don't know something, I'll even ask publicly as I did here, like what, what is CDP? And uh, Simon was kind enough to explain, this is the Chrome debugging protocol, okay? Or Chrome DevTools protocol. Um, but this is going to make it easier for us to use these functions right there inside of our test code. It's very powerful, right? This access to the CDP from our test, this opens up a world of possibilities. For example, we can mock the geolocation of our browser to do testing in areas that we aren't actually physically located. So that's like super dope, right? So for example, you know, we're on a road trip now. Let's say that we wanted to test the find a store functionality of a business, okay? This sort of feature, this uses your browser's geolocation to determine where you are so that it can provide information that's relevant to you, right? When you go and you look up, you know, Pizza Hut or something like that, it's going to look at your location to give you the pizza huts that are near you, you know, so that you have a better experience. But from our test, how do we make our browser think that we're somewhere else? Because we want to test more than just, you know, I'm in California, maybe I want to test uh, something in a whole nother country, you know? How do I go about doing that without needing to do it manually? Well, with this access to the CDP, we can change the geolocation of our browser. So there's a new method in the Chromium driver class called execute CDP command. Now I'm using Chrome driver here, but remember what I just said, Chrome driver extends from Chromium driver. So you can use this method in any of the Chromium subchildren, you know, the children classes of Chromium or Chromium itself. All right, now this method takes a string which represents the command name and it also takes a map which holds any needed arguments for the command, all right? So looking at this, okay, I don't know what to do, right? I don't know, I don't know the command names and stuff like that. So how do I figure this stuff out? Well, to get the available commands and their options, you can consult with the Chrome DevTools protocol website and you can search for whatever you want. So they have um, everything listed at all of the possible commands and what they do and all of their options. So I went there, I still wasn't sure, you know, I didn't want to read through the entire documentation. So I wasn't really sure. All I knew is that I wanted to change <laughs> the geolocation. So I just typed that in geolocation. And when I did, I saw, um, this geolocation override command set geolocation override command. Um, so that's the command. Great. Perfect. And here it also showed me that it takes three arguments because in, in the Selenium, it's just open. You send a map 
meaning it could have however many options that are needed. So you don't know how many options are needed without coming here to look and see what you need, right? So this is saying you need three option, three <laughs> arguments if you want to set the geolocation override. You need the latitude, the longitude, and the accuracy. And all of these are actually optional as it says here so you might get away with just passing in an empty map but of course what are you changing it to if you don't give it anything so that doesn't really make much sense right okay so back to our selenium code we can see i set the command as emulation dot set geolocation override so i just copy that literally from the website pasted that bad boy right there all right and then like the doc specify the second parameter of this, I'm going to need a map with the latitude, the longitude, and the accuracy. So I create my map here, and maps are key value pairs, right? So I just copied the key from that website. It told me latitude, longitude, accuracy. I copied each of those three keys, and then I went to um, Google Maps to get the coordinates of the location that I wanted, right? So I just picked like, this is in Austin, Texas, right? So I just went to Google Maps, put in Austin, Texas. In the URL, you can see the latitude and the longitude, all right? And the accuracy, I'm gonna be honest, I don't know what that means. I searched the internet, I could not find <laughs> all the range of values. I know when I put zero in, it did not work and when i put one or anything greater it worked so i'm thinking maybe it's a range from zero to one or something like that and i don't know anyway i just went with one here okay um so i then i passed that map in as the second argument to the execute cdp command and then we're good to go you know you can navigate to your application and now your browser thinks that you are in another place okay now execute cdp command isn't the only new addition for chrome uh devtools protocol even though that's really powerful but you also have this new get devtools method from the Chromium driver class and all of its children classes as we see with Chrome driver here. So this class has methods to allow us to interact with the CDP in other ways. So you see send and uh, there's some built-in APIs, right, um, with the send. So that makes it, I guess, a little bit easier. So this is kind of similar to, um, what we just saw but there's some additional you see how this send command takes a command or whatever so instead of like having to go find the command and paste it in there there are some built-in commands that selenium is providing as a wrapper around these cdp things right all right so that's pretty neat um here's an example we can listen for network events and we can even emulate different network conditions such as like being offline or setting the connection type to like a slower one, right? So in this example, I'm setting it to 2G so that I can test how my application behaves in slower networks, right? So this is, oh my God, this is like the best addition, I think the most powerful one to Selenium 4. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. I'm just showing you a couple of examples here. But CDP has lots of various commands that allows you to control and monitor the state of your browser. And with Selenium 4, we'll be able to easily leverage this. So this is really powerful stuff here, okay? All right, so there's so much in Selenium 4 to play with. And you might want to try it out on your own applications. In fact, I really, really encourage you to do so, right? The Selenium project is open source. And one important way that we can contribute back to this lovely project that has given us so much is to find and report bugs, right? So that's just what I did um, when I was playing with relative locators, and they were so appreciative of that. Um, if you're using Java, you want to get started with this. You can go to the mavenrepository.com and search for Selenium Java. 
um, here's the link here if you don't want to search. Uh, this will be clickable and we'll give you the slides sometime next week. But you'll see the version four releases. There you see them. Notice all of them are in alpha. What does that mean? What this means is don't use this in your actual work projects, at least not yet, because things are not final, right? They're still working on this. They just made it available so that we can try it out and we can express if there are any gaps in our specific scenarios or if there are any bugs, right? So I do encourage you, download them, play with them, but maybe you know make a little side project for your application and try it out that way. Don't like have this gating your CI bills or anything like that. All right. So you can add this dependency to your project here, you know, right there on Maven repository. They give you Maven, Gradle, all the good stuff. So you can just copy this and add that to your project. Or better yet, Shama, and who is on the call, Shama Ugali, she has written a step by step guide for Java and JavaScript users. Shout out to Shama. Hello. Uh, so check that out. And she'll she'll walk you through that, how you set it up. All right, all right. So, my friends, we've come to the end of our journey, our little road trip on testing Selenium four. We have a couple of minutes. Let's see if there are any questions that I can answer for you. So yeah, we do have some questions about CDP, and okay. we have some general ones. All right, um, let's get the CDP ones first, please. Yeah. Yes. Can we read the responses of the HTTP requests that happen while the user interacts with the page? Yes. I'm going to keep it short, but yes, with the CDP, you can also get all of that network activity. You can get like the responses. Say, for example, you wanted to uh, load a page and make sure you don't get any 404s from any images or anything like that. You can do all of that now quite easily. Can you use CDP to see which AJAX calls are in progress and wait until they're all they've all returned? Yeah, you should be able to, right? So anything that you can do in Chrome DevTools, you'll be able to do with the CDP. So they've offered those two options. The one that is execute CDP command, meaning we don't have a pretty API for you. Go <laughs> figure it out go to you know the chrome devtools website get the command paste that bad boy in here and we'll run it for you um also they provided the send right so the devtools.send method and that one has some nice uh apis that they've already created they're still working on this simon has told me he's so excited about it y'all he's told me you know they were making all these nice apis so I don't know if it's a built-in API for the Ajax one, but even if it's not, if you can figure out how to do that same thing in Chrome DevTools, then you can do it within Selenium. Does, CD, uh, does CDP enable us to stub API responses or is it only client-side data? Uh, I think only client-side, right? So same thing like if you were doing this manually in your browser. I don't think you can stub a, a response within Chrome DevTools itself. Um, do you know how Selenium is, if Selenium is making improvements in handling extremely dynamic front-end frameworks like Angular and React? So I use, um, I use Selenium for things like React, Angular, these types of, you know, dynamic frameworks, and I don't have a problem with them. Um, I think the key is knowing how to use the Selenium API in the way that you need to, right? So it's not going to be as straightforward as, say, like, you know, Cypress that is automatically handling asynchronous calls and things like this. So you are going to have to use, mostly what I use is like that uh, WebDriver Wait API, 
And if I know, you know, I'm waiting for this action to finish or I'm waiting for uh, something, you know, some dynamic thing to occur on the page, then I can do so. So I don't have the problem of, you know, flaky things that a lot of people complain about um, with Selenium because I do use the WebDriver weight quite heavily. Does Selenium 4 have any capabilities with respect to CAPTCHA handling? And if not, any suggest any suggestion on yeah, handling yeah. those? So it does not because that's not an encouraged behavior. So from your automated test, you should like a robot shouldn't be able to trick CAPTCHA, right? That's the whole purpose to make sure you're a human being. So um, my advice is to stop trying to do that. Instead, what you can do is use like feature flags. So work with your development team to enable something that allows the capture to be turned off for testing purposes. So that's what I've done in the past. Um, and you can do that quite easily now with the CDP. So you can send in headers and stuff like that to the browser. Um, so you can send those headers in where it's saying like this is a test uh environment and then that'll disable your captcha if you know your development team agrees to do this so that's what i suggest you do don't try to automate against this so unfortunately uh that's all the time that we have for today uh so just a few things before i let ng say her goodbyes so first of all we're going to leave the session open uh, for a few more minutes uh, so you can ask uh, any other questions that you might have or thank Angie. Uh, she will receive all your notes uh, after the session. Uh, one thing that we didn't mention is that today, I think, Angie, uh, it was announced that Angie joined the GitHub uh, STARS program. So if you want to congratulate her on that as well, now is a great time to do that. Um, uh, and of course, if you have any follow-up questions, you can always reach out to Angie on social media. Uh, so I do want to thank everyone to join us for this live event. And of course, thank Angie for this very hands-on session. Uh, the recording and the slides will be emailed to you by end of day Monday. And I do hope to see you at our next event. Thank you all so much um, for not only attending, but all of the questions that you all asked. They were excellent questions. Um, like I said in the beginning, I'm not an expert in Selenium 4, so some of your questions I didn't have definitive answers to, but since I'll get the list of all of these questions, I'm gonna take that as a to-do for myself, and I'm gonna, cause I wanna know the answers too. So I'm gonna explore some of these things and probably write like a blog post with some of your questions, and I'll answer them and provide you with like, you know, the code samples and stuff, okay? Thank you all so much. It was so fun. Thank you.